had service, we averaged 118, 118 over the three nights we had service. On Sunday, we had 156 here last Sunday. With that being said, the average is 128 for the whole Vacation Bible School. But the greatest thing of all is we had 30 children give their life to God last week. 30 children said that Jesus came into their life and changed who they were. And I thank God for Restoration Chapel. I thank God for you. I thank God. I think about people like Sister Misty who was here um, Monday and Tuesday. I think she was here about 12 to more hours than that. She was here all day. And, and Amber and, and, and Sister Courtney and, and Brother Michael and, and all the other ones that were here that could help and, and be here and and the ones that help teaching, I think uh, brother, uh, uh, brother Jackie and Brother Bill and Brother Hank for getting up here and doing a dance for us. That was awesome and great. <laughs> um, that made my whole vacation Bible school right there, I tell you. I, I, that's the reason why we had 30 kids get saved right there. But, um, but I tell you what, we had a great time with the Lord, and I just thank you so much. If you have your Bibles today, go ahead and turn to Matthew 14. And we're going to be in verses 22 through 33. And I want you to repeat after me for a second. Say, are you ready? Are you ready? To jump. To jump. Are you ready? Are you ready? To jump. To jump. All right, we're going to our scripture in Matthew 14, starting with verse 22. It says, and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go before him and to the other side. While he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into the mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the, for in, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand. And caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying of a truth that art the Son of God. Today we start our new series, Give Me Faith. And I was, as I was preparing this over the last couple of months to get into this series, I realized that a lot of us does not really know what faith is. You see, one minister once said that faith is a deep-seated confidence in God. He went on to say that regardless of the circumstance in your life, regardless of what you get for obeying or what you lose from obeying, it does not matter because God is enough. God is enough. He went on to say that faith is holding on to, to go no matter what you're facing. The Incarnate Dictionary defines faith as a belief in, devotion to, or trust in somebody or something, especially without logical proof. Church, I really want us to say this, and if you don't get anything else out of this series, this is what I want, want you to get out of it. We need to become a church of faith. Amen. Amen. We need to become a church of faith and realize no matter what, we believe in a God, even though we've never seen it. I think it's sad. We believe in a lot of stuff that we have never saw before. But it's hard to believe in a God that created us. It's hard to believe in a God that... A lot of us try to explain some of the things that go on in this world. They can't be explained because God's the one that does it. But church, we have lost a lot of faith. We've lost, listen, I, I think it's funny, me and, me and Brother Jackie, we, you know, we always joke around. And one day we were standing out the side door and, he, and we was talking about the attendance number again. And, and a lot of people says, Bobby, why are you worried about attendance? Because I'm worried about souls. And the more souls you get into the house of God, the more souls you can reach. And
And the more souls that you can reach is more building of the body of Christ. And the more that you build the body of Christ is the more that we can reach a nation and a generation that does not know the knowledge of God and has never seen his works before. So, yeah, I am worried about souls. I am worried about attendance. But one day he said, Bobby, we're shooting for the moon. And I really never heard that before. But I understood what he's talking about. I said, no, Brother Jackie, we're claiming the moon. I said, because when you shoot for something, it doesn't matter if you make it or you miss it. But when you claim it, you go after it. Listen, church, I'm claiming that we will be a church of faith that relies on God no matter what. Through the bad times, through the good times. Some of you have been here. This church has had some rough times before. But you believe that there is a God that is greater in this world. Is greater than a circumstance. It is greater than anything that we can ever think of. And that is what faith is all about. Amen. All about. Some of us worry from week to week if we'll ever have enough money to pay our bills. You know what, church? I say, give it to God and have faith in Him. That don't mean you sit on your couch and eat potato chips all the time. That means you still got to work. You still got to go. You still got to pray. You still got to move. But you have faith that if you live your life right for God, He will provide. Amen. That's right. He is your protector. He is your provider. He is your comfort. But you must first have faith that He will do what He said. That's right. A lot of us lose that sometimes. You know, I don't talk about this a lot because I, I, there's a lot of other things. But, you know, there's people to this day that does not believe Jesus Christ is coming back. There's people to this day that believe this and that and that, but they do not believe that Jesus, and I'm, I'm talking about, there's people in church buildings today that does not believe that Jesus is coming back. Well, church, I realize that my faith becomes the Word of God. My faith follows the Word of God. My faith is the one that's in Him, the author, the creator, the alpha, the omega, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the great I am. That's where my is. And if he says it's going to happen, it will happen. Amen. Amen. Listen, church, you have the victory. Amen. We talked the whole series about being a fighter. We talked about roaring the roar of victory. But church, I want to let you know, the Bible says if you believe in him, you shall not perish, but you will have everlasting life. That means no matter what's going on in this world today, if you have faith in him, you have the victory. That's right. It doesn't matter how sick you are. It doesn't matter how bad you hurt. It doesn't matter how your feelings are. Church, if you have faith in him, you will have the victory. That's right. Amen. I see children here like Rock and Dane and Elijah and Brooklyn. You tell them something, they know it's going to happen because they believe it. Us adults cannot even get that childlike faith anymore. We've been let down so many times, but you know what the problem is? The reason why we have, don't have any faith anymore is because we put our faith in the wrong thing. That's right. Listen, I am human. I am not perfect. There's going to be times that I might let you down, but your faith shouldn't come on some preacher. Your faith should come on Jesus Christ. That's right. Your faith shouldn't come on your husband or your wife. Your faith comes on Jesus Christ. If you have your faith in Him, He will make sure the relationship, as long as He's in the center of it all, He will make sure the relationship will keep going. If you have faith on Him through financial troubles, He will make sure you go and you need what you need and He'll give you what you need as long as you have faith in Him. That's right. Church Restoration Chapel, I'm declaring it today. We need to become a church of faith. If we say, if God gives it to us and says it's going to happen, then we believe it and we go out and do the work. Now listen, faith comes with something. Faith comes with action. It's okay to believe. It's okay to believe. But you know what? After you believe, you've got to move. Amen. After you believe, you've got to move. Listen, when I was in school, I believed all the time that I was going to make straight A's. It didn't happen all the time. You know the reason why? Because I didn't study a lot. And when you don't study, guess what happens? 
You don't know what's going on the test. Well, yeah, I do, Bible. You don't know me. Well, you know what? I look at your grades and see how they are. Especially when I got into college. I had faith in myself that I would always get stuff done. One night at 12 o'clock, my paper was due at 8 o'clock the next morning. I started my paper at 12 o'clock the night before, and at 2 o'clock, guess what happened? We had a power outage. You know what happened to my paper? Poof, it's gone. I can see God up there laughing. You know what? With faith becomes action. You gotta walk the walk as you talk the talk. Amen. Church, we need to become a church of faith. We need to become a church that really believes that God's gonna take care of us. Hebrews 11 and 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Paul broke down faith in two parts. Faith is first the substance of things hoped for. What he is saying is faith and hope go together. And the same thing that, that are the objects of our hope should be the object of our faith. What I mean is that there must be an expectation that God will perform all that he has promised to us in Jesus Christ. You know it's sad? People pray prayers and never believe they'll ever happen. I remember when we was trying to get this building over here, Brother James, we prayed for three years. And there was people that, got, that had doubt. I ain't gonna lie, I had doubt that we'd never get that building. And it was kind of funny when somebody said, hey, you can have that building, then they still had doubt. I don't think we can make the payments. I don't think we can do this. I don't think we can fix it up. Listen, God says if I give it to you in my name, then it's going to be taken care of. So you must expect that God's sayings is true. You must believe that whatever God says is what we can go for. You must hope. You must hope. Listen, church, if we're going to ask God for something, shouldn't we have faith when he gives us the answer? Shouldn't we have faith when he provides it? Shouldn't we have faith, even when he doesn't give us the answer, that no matter what, we'll still believe in who he is? Amen. The three Hebrew children, I love it, because they said, listen, I'm not going to worship anybody else. I'm going to worship God. Well, when the king, King Nebi, came to him, and King Nebi said, guess what? If you don't worship me, I'm going to throw you in the fire. You know what they said? The three Hebrew children said this. Listen, listen, I want you all to hear this. Even if he don't. We're still worshiping Him. How many of you say you have that kind of faith? That even if He don't provide, even if He don't give the protection, I will still worship Him. I expect God to do something great. I expect Him to be my healer. I expect Him to provide. But even if He doesn't, even if He doesn't, guess what? I still Worship Him. Try. Jesus dwells in our soul by faith. And the soul is filled with the fullness of God because of that. Through faith we can have hope. And with hope our faith becomes stronger. The second thing Paul says faith is. Faith is also the evidence of things not seen. Paul is saying that faith demonstrates to the eye of the mind. The reality of those things that cannot be discerned by the eye of the body. What I mean is faith is a firm uh, asset of the soul to the divine revelation. It sets its seal that God is true. You see, faith is a full, full application of what God has revealed as holy, just, and good. We will not see Jesus until the day he comes back. But through faith, we know he's alive. Hebrews 11 goes on to talk about faith. And verses 4 through 31 talk about these people that came against something big and bigger than them. And God showed up and he was bigger than the obstacle. Then in verse 35 we see a big change. I want you to hear this. In 35 through 38 it says, Women received their dead raised to life again. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And, and others had trial, cruel mockings, and scroungings, yet moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn or stirred, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskin and goatskin, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They 
They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in the dens and caves of the earth. That don't sound too happy right there. Listen, if this happened at Disney, Disneyland, nobody would go home. But you know what's awesome? God said, those that have faith in me, no matter what, might not receive their reward here, but will receive their reward in heaven. Those that go through troubles and trials and tribulations and feel like they never go out of it, they will receive their reward in heaven. Those that even were they killed through the sword, through their, through their um, uh, persecution, through all this. Listen, church, if they just hold on, hold on to what God has in store for them, their reward will be in heaven. Have you ever went to something and you thought it was over and then all of a sudden, boom, there's something that's a surprise? And you get excited about that. I, I, like, like you get done with eating and you have some banana pudding and then, and then somebody comes out and says, listen, there's still something left in the bowl. <laughs> Your belly not hurt. You're all tired, but you're like, yeah, I'm giving me some of that. Listen, church, the reward is not here. The rewards of heaven. Amen. Bobby, I want to be blessed here. You don't know what I'm going through. You know what? Listen, it doesn't matter what you're going through. It matters what you're accomplishing. And the accomplishment comes from Jesus Christ. He says all good gifts come from above. All good things come from above. The old things are passed away. Listen, church, when you give your life to God and you have that faith that you're saved, it says you become a new creature. But church, how great is it to know that day that you meet Jesus Christ, this earth passes away. All the troubles passes away. Even the rewards you received here passes away. And you get that great award of worship and, 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 and just being with Jesus Christ all the time. That's the reward we're looking for. It's looking for Him. That leads us to our text today. In Matthew 14 and 22 through 33, Jesus had been teaching them all day and provided a great miracle by feeding the 5,000. He told His disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side. Now listen, church. When Jesus says you're going to make it to the other side, guess what? You're going to make it. <laughs> Amen. I don't think we realize that. When Jesus says you're going to make it to the other side, you will make it to the other side. That's right. You can go kicking and screaming. You can go scared. You can go all upset. But if Jesus says you're going, you're going. You know what's so sad? A lot of us want to jump off the boat before it gets started because we see the storm ahead instead of realizing that God said you're going to make it to the other side. That's true. Listen, he told them to go to the other side. When the disciples went to the other side, Jesus went up to the mountain as they were going across the, across the lake. They went up into the mountain to pray. And while the disciples were crossing the sea, a great storm arose. And the disciples began to be afraid. You see, last time they were in a storm, Jesus was on the boat. And they woke up because they were scared. They woke him up because they were scared. And they didn't think he would make it. But guess what Jesus did? Jesus stood up and said, peace be still. And the waves and the wind stopped. Church, I want to let you know, the storm you just went through will prepare you for the storm you're about to go through. Amen. That's right. Even if it don't even look the same. <laughs> Jesus then approaches them by walking on the sea. And this morning I want to look at three critical points in the story to see how faith truly works. And with these three points I want to ask, I want you to ask yourself a question. Are you ready to jump? Faith is fueled. The first point is faith is fueled by affection, boldness, and obedience. Matthew 14, 28 through 29 says, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. You see, when Peter realized it was Jesus, he desired to come to him because he had a great affection for him. I'm so excited. And I know I 
talk about my son a lot, but that's okay. He's my son. He's the greatest kid in the world. <laughs> Even when he's me. But every day I go into the doors at, at daycare and I, I try to sneak around where he don't see me. I'm not trying to be a mean parent. I'm just trying to, you know, surprise him. And when I come through the door and he sees me, no matter, no matter where he's at, he starts running. He goes, Daddy! <laughs> and the toys go flying up in the air. The little kids are like, and his best friend Ethan is like, Elijah is your daddy. <laughs> but he comes running at me. It doesn't matter what was in his way. He was going to get to his daddy. He was going to bust through. You know what, church? How many of you are running towards Jesus? No matter what's in your way, you're going to get to him. Listen, Peter knew. When he knew that was Jesus out there, he said, I love you so much, Jesus, I'm coming after you. Just let me get on the water. Just let me get close to you. Let me just come to you. This storm might be bad, but you know what? I see Jesus as my prize, and I'm going to go towards him. I don't care what's going on in this boat. I don't care about the Coast Guard coming here or the helicopter flying here. I'm going to Jesus Christ because that's who I love. That's who saved me. That's who called me. And my heart is on him. It takes affection to go after Jesus. But after you have the affection, you've got to have boldness. Christians sometimes are the wimpiest people on this earth. And I'm not trying to be mean. Everybody else is going to stand up for their beliefs, but Christians sit down and do nothing. Now, I'm not telling you to go out and do something crazy. Because that ain't who we are. Everything we do is supposed to be through the love of God. And God provides the power. He provides the strength. He provides the knowledge. That's what really gets me. Before you're going to go out and try to get somebody and tell somebody about Christ, you better pray up and get yourself ready first. That's right. Michael Jackson said, I'm going to start with a man in the mirror. If I'm going to make a change. You better get yourself ready. But listen, when you get yourself ready, you better have boldness to go out and tell people about Jesus Christ. You better let, listen, I, there's plenty of rappers out there that rap, rap about all this other stuff. You know, half that stuff the rappers rap about, they don't even do. Those people that sing, half the stuff they sing about, they don't even do. But you know what? If we would just allow Jesus Christ to walk through us and just be bold and listen to what he says and do what he says. When's the last time you went up to somebody on the street and said, listen, God told me just to talk to you. God led me to you and said, listen, I just thank you so much. When do we have enough faith to say, listen, I'm jumping out of the boat. Are you ready to jump? When Jesus is in front of me, I'm jumping out of the boat and I'm looking at him. I'm going towards him and I love him so much that no matter what? I will be bold and I will follow him. Follow him. But then, I love it because sometimes we get too bold and we jump before we ask. <laughs> if you ain't got a job, don't go try to buy a Ferrari. I'm just throwing that out there. Somebody needed that. Because, listen, if you don't have the money to start off with, then you're never going to be able to pay for it anyway. What I mean is, boldness comes from obedience. Peter, before he jumped in the water, he was probably anxious. He was on that boat, and I can see him now. He's probably right here. He's like, oh, Jesus, I see you out there. I'm ready to go out there. I want to jump. I'm bold. I believe in you. I love you so much. But you know what he did first? He said, Jesus, can I come? Jesus, let me come. Let me come. You see, boldness comes with obedience. Faith, you must be obedient and listen to what he says. Listen, church, we must have an affection for Jesus Christ. We must be bold, but we must be obedient to what he says. We better ask before we jump. The second point is, faith allows true believers to do greater things. Matthew 14 and 29 says, And he said, Come. 
And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Jesus tells Peter to come out upon the waters, which was a shock to a lot of people. You see, when the Pharisees asked for a sign, they, they had not only a repulse, but a reproof for it because they did it with a design to tempt Jesus. But when Peter asked for a sign, he received it because he did it because he trusts Jesus Christ. It's hard to have faith when you don't know the person you have faith in. He trusts Jesus. Church, if you don't truly have faith and you are not truly devoted to Jesus, then Jesus won't provide or allow you to do great things in your life. Yeah, you might make it day to day and things might happen for your good, but you want to be able to walk on the waters in your storm. You see, when Jesus told Peter to come, Peter jumped out of the boat and he did just as Jesus said and he walked out on the water. Ephesians 2, 5 and 6 says, even when we are dead in sin, have quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved and have raised us up together and made us sit together in a heavenly place in Christ Jesus. Galatians 2 and 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. These scriptures shows us that the communion of a true believer with Jesus is represented by us being inside of him. If you want to do greater things, you must truly believe in him and allow him to move instead of yourself. What I mean is that through the strength of Jesus, we are born above the world and able to trample upon it, keep from sinking into it, from being overwhelmed by it, obtain a victory over it by faith in Jesus' victory and with him are crucified to it. First John 5 and 4 says, For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. Amen. How many want to be overcomers? Amen. How many want to overcome sickness? Amen. Amen. How many want to overcome death? Amen. How many over, want to overcome taxes? Amen. How many want to overcome bills? Amen. How many don't want to work no more? Amen. I want to be overcomers of this world. And it says the only way that I can be an overcomer is first, I must be born of God. Amen. Good. John 16 and 33 says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. Amen. That in me you might have peace. Not, not in Dr. Field. Not in medicine. Not in alcohol. Not in drugs. Through me you'll have peace. Amen. Through me you'll have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Hey, be happy. You know the reason why we should be happy? Because I have overcome the world. Amen. I wanted to do this the other day, but I thought they might get mad at me. At McDonald's, that lady was not having a good day. You know, the drive through lady that's not really happy all the time. I almost want to say, be a good cheer. You have overcome this Big Mac. You have overcome this cash register. I want to tell you, listen, if you could just look and just give your life to God, you would just have peace. Because you are an overcomer. You are an overcomer. You are more than conquerors. You are better than this world because God has given you the right power. He's given you the right things. But first, you must have faith in Him. That's right. In Him. Overcome the world. Galatians 6 and 14 says, But God forbid that I should, should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. What I'm trying to tell you is that without faith, then we will never be more than conquerors. And when the storms come, it will separate ourselves. We will separate ourselves from the love of Jesus. You see, with faith, the sea of the world becomes like a sea of glass. It's the ones that have gotten the victory through Jesus will stand upon it and sing. 
Revelation 15, 2 and 3 said, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory of the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the hearts of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are the ways, thou King of saints. You see, we have faith in Him. We might not walk on a heart will lake, but we will walk over the enemy. We will walk over the trials and tribulations in our lives. We will walk over the storms. Which leads me to our last point. And I think this is one of the most important points. Our faith will stumble if we do not have our eyes on Jesus. Matthew 14, 30 and 31 says, But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And he began to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Peter was doing so great. He had the affection. He had the boldness. He had the obedience. He was a true believer in Jesus and he knew something great was about to happen. But then he began to sink. His fear took his eyes off of Jesus and he began to worry about everything else except for him. You see, church, the strongest faith and the greatest courage have a mixture of fear. Those that can say, Lord, I believe, must also say, Lord, help my unbelief. And the only thing that can cast out fear is perfect love that comes from God. And you see, when Peter jumped in the water, he was very solid. But afterwards, his heart failed. And the lengthening out of the trial discovers the weakness of his faith. What I'm trying to say is this. A lot of times when preachers preach this and when people talk about this, they try to blame Peter. Well, if I was walking on the water, I would look to Jesus and have faith. Well, let's go to the lake. See how many of you ready to jump. What I'm trying to say is, listen, we're all just like Peter. Because there comes times in our lives where the storm gets so rough around us that we lose faith in what God's about to do inside of us. And I want to let you know this, that usually that time we lose faith is about that time we're going to have a breakthrough. Because see, Peter jumped over, which a lot of us wouldn't even jump over to, to start off with. We'd have been like the other disciples. Go ahead, Peter. Go ahead, I'll sit here, I'll, I'll see if you're okay. I got the boat ready, you know, we'll toss it out there and get you. But you know what, Peter had enough faith to jump over. But when he jumped over, the storms got a little bit worse, it got a little bit rough. And instead of looking at Jesus, he started looking over. He started looking over here and looking over there. And when he started looking over here and looking over there, guess what happened? He started to sink. Church, I've said this before and I'll tell you this again. If your eyes are not on Jesus, you'll begin to sink faster than you ever thought. If this church ever wants to see growth, our eyes must be on Jesus. If you want to ever see your relationship grow, your eyes better be on Jesus. Try Don't it. worry about your companion right now before you get right with Jesus. Well, Byron, that just sounds mean. You know what? If you get right with Jesus, then the companionship will come. Because it says God is love. That's what my word says. I don't know about y'all's words. That means you can't have love unless you have God. In middle school, I told a bunch of people I love them. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Every week you had a new girlfriend. You said, hey, I love you. You talk them on the phone, play that music in the background. You thought you were something, right? <laughs> Half time you didn't even say no words. You just let the music play. <laughs> and they say, you still there? Yeah, just listen. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> but you know what? That's no way to build a relationship. The best way to build a relationship is on the foundation of God. You have a job issues, you have financial issues, you know what? Your eyes better be on Jesus Christ and not on that money. Well, you don't understand. My eyes are on those bills. Yeah, you better put those in your Bible and you better start praying and you better work your tail off to get those bills paid. 
If I have faith, yeah, you know what? You better do something about that thing. You first got to jump. What I'm trying to tell you is this. Listen. When we take our eyes off of Jesus, nothing good can happen. I love it because we usually say Jesus is up. We usually say Jesus is up. So we look at Jesus upwards. You know, have you ever seen somebody walking like this? Hey, man, anybody got seen a teenager with a cell phone lately? They're typing like this. You know what happens? They don't look up, so they run into stuff. There was a poor woman that was texting one time. He fell into a pond in a, in a mall because she was texting and not looking up. She didn't even see that pond. She just boom, fell into the pond. Then she tried to jump up like nobody saw her. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is if you're looking up in your eyes on Jesus, he'll guide you the right way. You don't have to worry about running into anything because, listen, even when the storm comes, your eye is still on Jesus. So the waves are over here. The waves are over here. They're in front of you. They're behind you. But if your eye is on Jesus, he said you'll make it to the other side. So he's going to be pushing you. He's going to be guiding you as long as your eyes are on him. Through so the trials and tribulations in your life, you've got to have faith. And the way you lose faith is by losing your sight on him. Abraham had strong faith because he was considered not his own body, and he minded not the discouraging impossibilities which the promise lay under, but kept his eyes on God's power. Peter, however, saw the winds and the waves, and instead of remembering what he had seen the last time the storm came, he feared for his life because, he did, uh, because of what was going around him. You see, church, when our spirit begins to sink, so does our faith, because our souls are upheld by faith. First Peter 1 and 5 says, Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Church, we must keep our eyes on Jesus, no matter what is going on around us, so we can have the faith to make it through the storms in our life. The world says we can't do it. The world says it's never been done before. But Jesus says, but Jesus says, Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible through me. As I said, Peter gets a bad rap for sinking. But the story doesn't end there. What I mean is out there, there are a lot that are here that doesn't even have enough faith to make it out of the boat. You see, when he started to sing, he gave us a lesson. When we lose our faith, you know what we need to do? Cry out to Jesus. Cry out to Jesus. What I mean is, listen, <coughs> I have learned in my life there's going to be times where I fall, there's going to be times where I sing, but I've learned as a Christian all I have to do is call on you. Sister Sherry used to sing a song that says, When I call in on Jesus, all things are possible. But listen, it didn't say he called on Jesus. He said he cried out to Jesus. He cried out to Jesus. You see, desperation a lot of times makes us do a lot of things that we don't like to do. But you know what, church? When, when we get to that point that we're at our lowest, it is time to get rid of our pride, it is time to get rid of ourselves, and it's time to pick up our cross and follow Him. I asked Sister Sherry to sing a song that she sung a couple weeks ago called Oceans. And as I was thinking about this song, I thought about how Jesus was telling us, listen, if we would just cry out to him, how much he would do for us. I told you earlier that I want this church to be a church of faith. But I understand that we'll never have perfect faith until we get to heaven. But I have understand, I have understood that when we're on the waters and we begin to sink, if we would just cry out to Jesus, he will reach his hand down. Amen. He will reach his hand down and he'll pick us up. He said,
says, listen, all you have to do is reach up. I, I don't know about this. I wasn't there. But I can probably tell you this. Peter probably didn't just sink to his knees. He probably didn't just sink to right here. He was probably to that point. <clears throat> what I mean is, we start to sink and we say, oh, it's going to be all right. I'll get myself out of it. But then when it gets to right here, you got two choices. You can either go under, or you can call on him. Call on him. A lot of us still think we can do it ourselves, and we start doggy paddling or splashing around. You know what usually happens? Most people that go to drown, they actually try to come up. Trying to do it ourselves instead of crying out to Jesus. I ask you this morning John 10 and 28 says, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Psalms 34 and 4 says, I sought the Lord and he heard me. And he delivered me from all my fears. The Bible tells us we should fear the Lord, but we should never be scared. Amen. Nobody will be scared. What I mean by scared is when that spider comes along, you do like my wife who dreams about bugs and wakes up in the middle of the night and she jumps up and like, ah! She's shaking all over and I'm like, what are you doing? And is she still asleep? What I'm trying to say is, listen, no fear will pluck us out of the hand of Jesus Christ. But we can take ourselves out. Church, I ask you to become a church of faith. With every eye closed and every head bowed,